Well, come on in. I am sharing with you a book review slash commentary on the book. I thought it was just me, but it isn't by Brene Brown. And while we're talking podcast style, you can watch this nice view of a road trip I took in January of 2023 from Houston to Marble Falls, Texas. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll put some little pop-up comments on the screen if you're interested <laughs> in the sites. Um, but yeah, if also you want to purchase this book, um, I will have the links down below. And just a disclaimer, um, it is an Amazon affiliate link, so if you use the link below, I'll get maybe a couple cents sent my way. <laughs> Every little bit counts. So if you use the link, I really appreciate it. Here we are in the road where we're going to Austin and we're heading towards LaGrange. So with that said, many miles ahead of us till we reach Austin. So grab your Big Gulp or your Texas tea or whatever makes you happy and ride along shotgun with me while we talk about this book. I thought it was just me, but it isn't, <laughs> by Brene Brown. We're going to talk about the subject of shame. You know what? Not a popular topic of conversation, am I right? Uh, but very necessary because it's quite common. And, uh, you know, a little personal sharing here. While I'm taking this drive... I was leaving a situation which I found quite personally shaming to me, which led me to read this book and want to share it with you. Am I completely healed at a level where I'm going to share with you exactly what that shaming experience was? Mm, no, nah, not quite there yet. I'm still working on it, but um, in time, I will perhaps open up more about this. In the meantime, let's talk about this book so we can learn and grow together. I think the goal of this book is to help the readers move from shame to shame resilience. And based on what Brene is saying, we do this by becoming more empathetic, basically practicing more courage, more compassion, more connection, and we move away from practicing fear, blame, and disconnection, which is very characteristic of shame. Is shame unavoidable in life? Probably so. I think, you know, in the book she says, you really can't become shame resistant. Maybe you can come, become shame resilient, but not necessarily resistant. I think... It's part of the human experience. It's inescapable, unavoidable. We just kind of have to accept it as part of life. And doing so might help us stay out of judgment towards others and even ourselves. Judgment in a way that impedes healing within ourselves and in our relationships as well. Okay, and sorry to those of you who heard a little bit of feedback on the microphone. I switched it out for a newer one, so hopefully y'all won't hear that anymore. But getting back to the topic at hand, <laughs> let's talk about what shame is, okay? Um, and because people get confused a lot about the meaning, and I think Brene really clarified it quite well throughout the book. She said that her own definition of shame is the intensely painful feeling of, or experience of believing we are flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. And throughout the book, she explains that shame creates fear, blame, and disconnection. And it's often experienced when we're entangled in a web of layered, conflicting, and competing expectations from ourselves and others. Now, I want to read to you a poem on shame written by Vern Rutsala, and this was shared in her book, and I, I've got to share it to you because it just so encapsulates 
what shame is for anybody who is not clear. This is a shame of the woman whose hand hides her smile because her teeth are so bad. Not the grand self-hate that leads to some razors or pills or swan dives off beautiful bridges, however tragic that is. This is a shame of seeing yourself, of being ashamed of where you live and what your father's paycheck lets you eat and wear. This is a shame of the fat and the bald the unbearable blush of acne, the shame of having no lunch money and pretending you're not hungry. This is a shame of concealed sickness, diseases too expensive to afford that offer only their cold one-way ticket out. This is a shame of being ashamed, the self-disgust of the cheap wine drunk, the lassitude that makes junk accumulate the shame that tells you there is another way to live, but you are too dumb to find out. This is the real shame, the damned shame, the crying shame, the shame that's criminal, the shame of knowing words like glory are not in your vocabulary, though they litter the Bibles you're still paying for. This is the shame of not knowing how to read and pretending you do. This is the shame that makes you afraid to leave your house. The shame of food stamps at the supermarket when the clerk shows impatience as you fumble with a change. This is the shame of dirty underwear. The shame of pretending your father works in an office as God intended all men to do. This is the shame of asking friends to let you off in front of the one nice house in the neighborhood and waiting in the shadows until they drive away before walking to the gloom of your house. This is the shame at the end of the mania for owning things, the shame of no heat in winter, the shame of eating cat food, the unholy shame of dreaming of a new house and car, and the shame of knowing how cheap such dreams are. Well, if that poem doesn't sum up shame, I just don't know what does. (laughs) But let's talk about what shame is not so that we don't get it confused with other things like embarrassment or guilt. And let's start off by saying that shame is the opposite of empathy, which requires courage, compassion, and connection. So throughout this book, Brene is trying to, I think, drive it home to the reader that we need to be focusing on the opposite of shame, which is empathy, and showing us how to do it. Now, embarrassment or embarrassing situations, you know, they're less serious than shame, um, and also less serious than guilt, okay? Um, And this would be, for example, like you're tripping over something or you misspoke in a conversation. It's very common stuff, happens to everyone all the time, right? We can just get over it. It's a bump in the road, let's just keep it moving, right? (laughs) Oops, (laughs) and you apologize and you keep moving on. That's embarrassment or embarrassing situations. Not the same with shame, okay? Not to be confused with shame that just kind of lingers and stays with you, okay? Guilt is often confused for shame. Um, And in her book, she says that it can be a positive motivator for change, but shame is not, to the contrary, right? They're both emotions of self-evaluation, but the difference is that, you know, shame says, I'm bad. Whereas guilt says, I did something bad. And shame is really a lot about who we are, whereas guilt is about more about our behavior. So there's very much, I think, more of a personalized impact of shame rather than guilt. Um, so if you're a guilt-prone person, you're going to focus on the behavior that's in question, whereas if you're a shame-prone person, you're going to focus on what you view as defective about yourself or inadequate or incompetent or flawed, right? 
So for example, um, you know, this example is given in her book about how if you were to miss work after a night of heavy drinking and you're a guilt prone person, um, well, you're probably likely going to say to yourself, hmm, if I keep missing work, I could lose my job. And then you're going to try to figure out what to do differently to move on from this problematic situation. But with a shame prone person in, in, in this scenario, in this example, they're very likely to think something along the lines of, I'm a complete failure because I keep missing work. And then they're going to start feeling unworthy and overwhelmed. And then when they get stuck in these emotions, the problems remain and they remain unresolved. And then they're unable to move on. So how do we overcome shame when it's so common and often hidden, suppressed, denied in our culture? Because, you know, she gives an example in, of, in her book of how she was boarding a plane and somebody asked her, well, what do you do for a living? And she said, oh, I study shame. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> disinterest, you know, well, it's actually pretty common is it not an interesting topic? I, I think it is an interesting topic, but um, maybe an unsavory one, which is why a lot of people don't want to really open up about these conversations, even though we should have them, right? I think that um, it's just one of many symptoms of how we culturally um, separate and insulate ourselves from others when we feel shame or we don't want to discuss shameful situations that others are going through rather than take the higher road of sharing our stories and creating positive change in one another's lives. Now in her book, she says one of the first steps is understanding shame, learning how to recognize it within ourselves and others because the presence of shame diminishes our capacity to practice empathy. And to become shame resilient, we have to do four key things. Number one, we've got to recognize and understand shame triggers. Number two, be intimately aware of our own shame web. Number three, be willing to reach out to others. And number four, be able to speak about shame. So how do you do that? How do you recognize your own shame triggers? Well, she says you've got to ask yourself, really be brutally honest with yourself about the way that you want and don't want to be seen by others. So for example, if you were to do a fill in the blank, <laughs> you would... Um, you know, have this sentence that says, I want to be perceived as blank, blank, and blank. How would you fill that in? You want to be perceived as what? And conversely, I do not want to be perceived as blank, blank, and blank, right? I mean, put in as many blanks in there as you want. Fill it in as many as is as is needed okay you get the gist the the idea is to explore the way you want to be perceived by others and don't want to be perceived by others because often um, we feel like we ought to not let people see anything that can be perceived as weakness or failure uh, for women, you know, it could be a number of things to be seen as uh, thin, as beautiful, as whatever, fill in the blank. For men, it can be they want to be perceived as strong, fearless, powerful, in control. Um, you know, I could go on, right? But however it is for you, we, we have to figure out the way we want to and don't want to be perceived by others and then figure out the source of these unwanted identities, right? Like dig deeper and ask yourself, 
what why does being perceived this way mean so much to me why does it mean so much to others and the unwanted identities being seen as not thin or uh, not attractive or not nice or not empowered or not successful not prosperous whatever fill in the blank um, why are these unwanted and where did the messages come from that fuel these identities I think a lot of us will find, as I have, that it comes from uh, obviously childhood programming, but also, you know, in my adult life, I've experienced a lot of criticism from other people, which now at this age stage in life of me almost pushing 50 now, I'm, I'm be- beginning to understand the level of pro- projection that many people are engaged in and starting to realize, oh my, I took this very personally when this person criticized me as X, Y, Z, when in fact they were really projecting their own insecurities onto me, but I took it on and I tried to accommodate and, you know, become something that was not authentic in in me just to prove to them that I'm not whatever inadequacy they were struggling with to basically make life easier for them with their struggle that really was not mine. I'm getting a little off topic there. So (laughs) I don't mean to go off that vein of thought, but um, getting back on track, you know, how do we speak about shame? Again, in a culture where people are very uncomfortable about it. We don't want to talk about Um, our dental problems. We don't want to talk about our money problems. We don't want to talk about our career or marriage problems or weight problems or fill in the blank. Um, So when we can't speak shame, what ends up happening is we can shut down and we can act out in unhealthy ways like through addictions. But when we can talk about shame, Brene is saying we express how we feel and then we're able to ask for what we need. And she says in her book, we cannot share ourselves with others when we see ourselves as flawed and unworthy of connection. It's impossible to be real when we are ashamed of who we are and or what we believe. And she also says in her book, shame begets shame. When we sacrifice authenticity in an effort to manage how we are being perceived by others, we often get caught in a dangerous and debilitating cycle. Shame, or the fear of being shamed, moves us away from our authentic selves. We tell people what they want to hear, or we don't speak. So what are some barriers to speaking shame there's a lot and I think that you might find as I have like well I tried to talk about it (laughs) but it got me nowhere it got me shut down it got me isolated and so I just stayed in that lonely place Um, and she talks about um, several barriers here to speaking about shame Um, One of which was very eye-opening to me. It helped me to understand uh, why I was having trouble when I was seeking connection, seeking empathy, um, and not getting it. And it's through something that she calls sympathy seeking. And I didn't realize I was being perceived this way. Um, And again, you might have run into this difficulty as well, but she says basically This is when maybe in your mind you think you're seeking empathy, you're trying to get connection, you're trying to speak about the shame you're going through, Um, but it is coming across in a way that almost says to the listener, feel sorry for me because I'm the only one going through this, or my situation is worse than everyone else's, and In some way, there is a breakdown in the communication where, you know, seeking empathy is confused with um, 
sympathy seeking. Because uh, empathy seeking would be actually speaking about and sharing your shame um, and, and getting that connection, creating that connection. But, you know, if you are doing this in a way where, again, the listener is hearing that, you know, you want to be felt sorry for or that you think you're the only one going through it and your situation is worse than everybody else as well. Um, it results in this feeling of disconnection and separation because you're being perceived as you just want confirmation and your uniqueness, your unique circumstances. And then people get agitated, irritated, and she even said crusty uh, because they feel like they're being manipulated, even possibly in some cases controlled, you know. And then the result is feeling as if you've been resented and dismissed. And um, this was a big eye opener for me, okay, because I, I remember like trying to communicate myself to um, some very important people in my life and walking away confused and bewildered as to why, why am I getting resentment off of these people? Why are they dismissing my feelings and emotions? And uh, what I learned from this in her book is that, you know, Instead of that other communication style, you've got to try to avoid communicating that, you know, you have it worse and that no one else can understand um, while seeking validation because that's going to frustrate the listener. And, you know, they're maybe even going to take you as thinking, you know, that you think that you're the only one entitled to have it hard or that you're the only one dealing with things that are unfair in life, or that you always you always think you have it worse than everybody else. So this is again, if you've caught yourself doing this, uh, try to try to stop it <laughs> because people resent that and they will be dismissive of your feelings, and you'll walk away not knowing why you're being resented and isolated. And 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 yeah, it might be true what that you feel alone and that yeah maybe you are the only one going through that that your position is a unique one okay that might all be true um but unfortunately if you communicate yourself from that position or from that viewpoint or perspective it's only going to make you feel more of that more of the isolation and aloneness Another barrier to creating, you know, connection in, in, in speaking shame is um, something she called stacking the deck. It's the, so you think you've got it bad card. Um, these are unhealthy comparisons that come up in conversations about who's got it worse. Similar to what I said earlier with the sympathy seeking barrier. Um, but, you know, we've all encountered this in conversations where we open up to somebody and they've, they're like, oh, you think you got it bad. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you who else has got it worse. You know, um, Brene gave an example of um, you say you have a drunk mother. They say that they have a drug addict sister. Um, you talk about being an un unmarried at 30. They are going to talk about being a single mom. You know, however it comes across, it implies that, um, oh, you know, whatever you're going through, oh, that's nothing. And then it makes the other person feel like nothing as a result. And really, it effectively shuts people down in their silence, thereby creating disconnect, isolation, right? So I think the answer here is we've got to stop trying to compete for last place and conversations um, minimizing people's pain try to refocus discussions on shared experiences of feeling disconnected and powerless and there are other barriers that she mentioned in the book i'm not going to go too deep into but you know basically talking about you know these attitudes that come up in, in conversations where somebody's reaching out, um, trying to share their shame and trying to create positive change in their life. But they're met with this attitude of, well, you know, it, it is a very dismissive. I'm sure everything's going to be just fine or that's nothing. At least you're not going through this over here. 
or, you know, bringing it back to themselves and where they just talk about their situation. And again, there's no connection between the two people of one person expressing their shame and the other person um, saying something maybe more empathetic, like, I'm really sorry, that can be a very lonely place that you're in. Is there anything I can do? Now, in her book, she talks a lot about practicing connection in a culture of disconnection, which I think is a huge problem because I feel like, you know, individually, you could read this book and you could go through a a good metamorphosis within yourself, your own self-awareness, and really trying to, um, again, connect with people in a meaningful way to create positive change in your life by doing everything that she's saying. But if we keep running into a society, a culture of people who by and large do not know how to do this, it's a challenge to say the least. So, um, you know, I guess it's like the Mahatma Gandhi saying, be the change you wish to see in the world. It all starts with us individually. We're waiting on others to change, but really the change has to start with us and being uh, vessels of empathy where um, we are allowing people to have the courage, the compassion, the connection that she's speaking of. And she does say uh, that, connection can empower but disconnection can be quite dangerous and she explains that disconnection is both the source and consequence of shame fear and blame and you know we've seen a lot of this in our relationships in our families and the forms of disconnection can come up through yes the blaming the insulating the judging the labeling raging stereotyping and she also explains that disconnection often comes up when people are so overwhelmed with trying to be who others want or need them to be that we just lose ourselves in the process, or I should say they lose themselves in the process. Um, they lose being grounded within that sense of self. And because they're not coming from a place of authenticity, personal authenticity, then authentic, meaningful change cannot occur apart from that authentic self. So it's really important that we are authentic in order to create authentic meaningful change but we're dealing with a lot of societal expectations which I think she rightly says are ridiculous and contradictory um, for example she says you know we've got this societal expectation upon us uh, this messaging like don't make people feel uncomfortable oh but be honest now don't upset anyone or their feelings but say what's on your mind don't be offensive but be straightforward be informed and educated, but don't be a know-it-all. And another one, another few ones are, don't say anything unpopular or controversial, but have the courage to disagree. Don't get too emotional, but don't be too attached. And you know these things are really, really subjective. Like, I mean, too emotional for one person may not be emotional, too emotional for another, okay? And so I could go on, she gives a lot of, of examples about this, which I think are pretty good and pretty spot on, but she says, unfortunately, what happens is that many people cope with the pain and discomfort of having to like shape shift into all these expectations through substance abuse. Whether it be, you know, food, alcohol, drugs, sex, relationships, they all serve as some kind of relief from living an, un an inauthentic life before the eyes of others in order to avoid shame. And so uh, she explains that often if you are a shame prone person, you're at risk for developing addictions and shame can lead to addiction and addiction can lead to shame, obviously. So 
remember from the beginning, we, we talked about the difference between guilt and shame, whereas, you know, guilt is I did something bad. Shame is I'm a bad person. See, it all comes full circle. So how do we become more resilient against shame? Brene explains that this is either taught in the home or not. Um, and in all fairness, I think it's good. She says, you know, parenting in and of itself is full of shame triggers. Uh, many parents are not wanting to be perceived as the bad parent or having unwanted identities as being the parent of that kid, whatever that kid is, right? <laughs> um, and so what ends up happening is parents often are trying to keep up appearances to avoid their own shame. Which, again, may very quite possibly put them out of their own authenticity. They're not being authentic. And again, we here we go with the cycle of, well, I'm not being authentic. So what I'm going to do to cope with it is get into addictions or unhealthy patterns in my relationships. So some of us, frankly, we were not taught it because our parents weren't. It's gone on and on generationally. And somebody has to break that chain and step in and start uh, teaching shame resilience to their children. Um, and even in the event that you teach your kid empathy um, through practicing courage, compassion, connection, she says they may still experience shame very likely um, from coaches, peers, teachers, where fear comes up, blaming comes up, disconnection comes up, right? Here we are again to this. It's part of the human experience. Can we really avoid it? We just um, need to become more resilient. You can't entirely resist it, right? She said, um, we cannot resist shame, but we can become more resilient to it. And so when we know our vulnerabilities to shame, right? These unwanted identities, where they're coming from, why we don't want to be perceived this way, but we want to be perceived that way, why it's so important to us. And we begin to normalize these things that, ah, you know, everybody's got these shame triggers, right? Um, then we start reaching out to others who have shame experiences as well. And it allows us to share our stories and create positive change in our lives. But she says the key is connection, which we're all wired for as social beings, right? Connecting emotionally, physically, spiritually, and intellectually is critical to our success because we all have the basic need to feel valued and accepted and to have a sense of belonging. And so again, I'm going to go back to saying, you know, that one by one individually, we are having to create a culture of connection. We're waiting for other people to do it. Um, but in reality, we have to be that change. Um, and I think, you know, just to get into more of a commentary portion on this book, that was my, my struggle with this book is after I read it, I thought, oh, well, yeah, I mean, but I'm, here I am still uh, <laughs> in this culture of disconnection. And, um, you know, how on a practical level do I deal with the reality that, um, you know, there are certain things that are not um, polite conversations to have with people. Um, you know, there are certain things that when you, let's say you're meeting somebody on a date um, and maybe you're going through difficult things um, where you want to be authentic uh, you don't want to get into hiding, suppressing, denying, um, arguably, you know, being perceived as deceptive, right? Not that you're intending to, but um, it, it's a fine line of opening up and who can handle that? 
I feel like the book is more addressing us individually on how we can help others deal with their shame um, and, and, and realizing within ourselves that the shameful experiences we've had, so have others. Everybody's just, you know, unfortunately um, trying to keep up appearances as far as I can tell. Um, but when we drop that, that need within ourselves to keep up appearances and make everything look, I don't know, Instagram filtered, you know, <laughs> perfect living large life, um, then we give other people permission to not have to live like that as well. All right. Let me know what you think down below. What... shame experiences have taught you about I don't know humility and being able to connect with others through difficult life experiences looking forward to hearing from you hope you enjoyed the drive with me riding shotgun next video I will be showing y'all Marble Falls make sure you subscribe like and share and comment till next time be blessed <music>